I'm not a mathematician. This is in a mathematics building. I don't belong in this building. I'm not a mathematician. I'm deaf and I'm not a cryptographer really. I, I do like cryptography and I use it a lot and I write papers in crypto, but mostly on applied side. So what you're going to see is very much an applied cryptography side of the spectrum. You won't see theoretical constructs, you won't see black boxes, generic models, anything like that. Forget it. Not in my talk. Uh, but you probably got enough of that yesterday. So uh, I will talk to you about privacy preserving, uh, sharing of sensitive information, and if you parse the English title, privacy preserving sharing of sensitive information, it sounds strange because it's kind of contradictory, but I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. And uh, I should say that this is uh, joint work with, uh, in particular, Jihi uh, from SNU and uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Stasiarevsky from uh, UC Irvine, and uh, uh, two of my PhD students, Emiliano Di Cristoforo and Jan Bindu. And please uh, feel free to ask me questions during or at the end of the presentation. Yeah. So here's an outline. I typically have an outline slide. I don't really follow the outline, but every presentation must have an outline. Otherwise, the speaker looks disorganized. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, something like this we're going to go through. I will start with something called privacy preserving information transfer, which is a, a, a small kind of simple uh, primitive for sharing sensitive information or author with authorization. And I'll talk about uh, really, the, the, the heart of this talk is about pri private set intersection protocols. And uh, efficient, in particular practical, efficient private set intersection. Then we'll uh, end up with uh, something new, which is something called size hiding uh, private set intersection, and then conclude with some future directions and ongoing work. Okay, so uh, most people here are security cryptography researchers who probably are already motivated to appreciate privacy. But privacy is a, if in case you want, you know, privacy is a basic uh, individual human right and often the desire to be private, to have ability to maintain privacy. It is something we all understand, right? We know when we don't have privacy. We know, but we don't know what privacy is. Right? It's very difficult to define what is privacy, but we know when we don't have it. Uh, interestingly, privacy is not only relevant to individuals, it's also relevant to corporations and governments and just larger entities and groups. So government wants privacy because it uh, runs a number of uh, organizations like, uh, I don't know, Department of Health that monitors um, epidemics of diseases. Uh, it runs uh, spy agencies like CIA and FBI and, and of course, Privacy is very important in that regard, right? Um, a lot of government business takes place in the privacy of small rooms with few people and no windows, right? So the same thing goes for corporations. Corporations are afraid of industrial espionage. They are afraid of losing their trade secrets. They are afraid of leaking their future strategy and plans. So therefore, privacy is very much important to them as well. In the general world, the general population, privacy has only recently became a, a, a subject of awareness. Because in the last 10 years, the, the explosion of information that uh, permeates the internet has caused some real concerns about privacy. Today, if you ask your grandmother if she worried about privacy and the internet, she'd probably say, yes, of course. So, yeah. 10 years ago, your grandma probably wasn't worried about privacy. Maybe you weren't even worried about privacy. So, as I said, there is lots more information disclosed on the internet, and a lot of that information is sensitive. Our health records, our um, various educational records, uh, personal information, uh, marriage, uh, birth, things like that, all kinds of things, bank account information, uh, just a great explosion of, of shopping habits, etc., of, of sensitive information that is available on the web or not available, but is somehow going through the web or is stored uh, or, or, or on the internet. But at the same time, why, why the amount of sensitive information 
on the internet increases, the privacy and accountability decreases or dissipates. And it's not, of course, very clear why that is, but that's just a fact. So at the same time, while we are concerned about privacy, we still have a need to share sensitive information sometimes. Now, maybe not us personally as human beings, but in the entities like governments and corporations do have a need to share sensitive information. So the question we're going to try to answer today is how to share only what must be shared and nothing else, right? So imagine a situation where you, are, you, you have a motivation to share some information or you are required to share it. But you don't know what, exactly what it is. You're just required to share it and you don't want to share anything else other than what's required or what you want to. So here are some examples. So DEA is the Drug Enforcement Administration. Okay? Uh, it's, a, it's like FBI or it's a police agency. Okay? A law enforcement agency. Deals mainly with illegal drugs. And they have secret agents. They have agents in other countries working with other countries' uh, law enforcement. And most of their agents operate undercover. Okay, so periodically the DEA contacts the police of each state in the United States to check whether the agents have been arrested or have had some problems with the law because sometimes even agents become criminals. Okay, but the DEA cannot disclose the names of the agents to the state police. doesn't trust them. Okay, so we have a problem, right? Notice that is a one way. You see the arrow means one way, right? So DEA wants something from the state police. The state police doesn't really want anything from DEA. Here's the CIA and MI6. The CIA you know, right? MI6 is a British CIA, right? So suppose that they are monitoring terrorist suspects and they have a list of these suspects. The CIA has a list. The MI6 has a list. Uh, they are... American law and British law prohibits sharing the list. Okay? But what about common suspects? What if they have Gene Sudik on one list and Gene Sudik on the other list? It would be nice if they could compare and that kind of information sharing is allowed. But how do you do it? In the real world, it's very hard, right? How do you do it with, pa with paper? It's not really achievable. But notice that this is a two-way requirement. So the, the British government or British MI6 wants to see the suspects that are common and the CIA wants to see the suspects that are common. So here's a, another example uh, from the civilian world. Okay? So you have a realty. Realty is a real estate, real estate agency. Okay? And so suppose uh, GE wants to sell a house. Okay? So she comes to one real estate agent, A, and says, I want to sign up with you to represent me. You will help me sell my house. But then, the, the real estate agency is supposed to be exclusively representing her. But what she does is she goes to another real estate agent there and, and, and becomes a double dealing client. And she signs up with him. So this is cheating. You're not supposed to work with more than one selling agent. So what would the real estate agencies want to do? They want to compare the lists of their customers to see if the same name appears on both lists so they can just kick them out or, or sue them, okay? So identify these kind of dishonest clients. This is again two-way. Here's another last one. This actually happened recently. Uh, this situation happened with a Swiss bank, a lot of Swiss banks, Union, United, uh, Union Bank of Switzerland, UBS was approached by the IRS. IRS is the tax authority, the American tax authority, which everybody fears, everybody hates, okay? I think more than Al-Qaeda, we hate the IRS. And the IRS said to the Swiss bank, give us all the names and account balances that are for American citizens. Anybody who is an American citizen or even resident, we want their names and account balances. And the Swiss have a long-standing tradition of banking secrecy. So they said, 
go away. Ah, but the U.S. government doesn't go away, right? You don't tell them to go away. Uh, there was a lot of pressure, and eventually they made some agreement to transfer some names. Anyway, you get the point. The point is that the Swiss government does not want to show the names of its customers, because probably, or the Swiss bank, because probably, if you know the Swiss banking system, you know that there are some people who are clients of Swiss banks who are not nice people. There are dictators, ex-dictators, yeah, people like that. So he doesn't want to show the names. So we have the same problem. So now you, get, you understand more or less, I think, the motivation, right? Or the, the examples that motivate this kind of work. So I have to ask about some environmental variables. So is this one-way sharing of information or mutual sharing of information? As you saw, some examples were one-way and some examples were mutual. In case of this sharing, is there one element on, on one side or multiple elements? So for example, suppose now the, the previous slide On the previous slide, most, most examples, every party had more than one entry, more than one item. But you can also imagine examples where some like FBI wants to search for a specific suspect, right? Or DEA is only searching for one agent. They suspect that the one agent had a problem with criminal um, behavior, right? So we're going to see some variance whether there's a single or multiple item on each side. What about data transfer? Now, if you look back at the examples, uh, this is not really about data transfer. This example, the realtors want to compare lists and identify items in common. But then, there's nothing else they really need. But here, the IRS wants to know not just the names, yeah, names are not interesting. They want to know the amount of money, right? The money is the most interesting. So there's data that comes with each item. This is, involves data transfer, not just identifying common set elements or um, list elements, but also data transfer. Okay, now another variable is whether the elements must be authorized authorized by some authority. So if, again, look, let's look here. Uh, in this case, for example, that's an interesting one. Who is the authority that would authorize the set elements? Anybody know? The customer. The customer himself. So if Jinyi signs a contract with me to represent her, and then with Jinyi to represent him, she will give us both a signature that authorizes us to represent. So that means that we cannot, we cannot have a situation where two real estate agencies just compare set elements of frivolous sets, any, where any input is allowed, right? Because that, that will, there will be no privacy that way. Or when IRS wants to approach Swiss Bank, right, they want to have some names of some suspects, right? And that suspect, those suspects should not be any names. They should not be able to put my name there just, for, just because they don't like me. They should have some reason to put my name there. And some court or some authority should authorize my name to be part of this. So that means authorize set elements. And then, uh, last but not least, there is the issue of a threat model, uh, as usual. Um, so we don't really worry about outsider attacks. Right, because when, when entities like this interact, we can assume that they have secure channels. We're really worried about and that's, well, the standard ways of creating and maintaining secure channels. But what we are worried about is the participants themselves, right? the malicious or the misbehaving uh, players. Because one CIA can try to cheat MI6, MI6 can try to cheat CIA, one Realty A can cheat Realty B, the bank may want to cheat IRS, etc., etc. <coughs> so what kind of behavior we expect? Well, of course, we have the two well-known models. Semi-honest or honest but curious. 
and malicious. And if we have a semi-honest model, the typical question is, why? Why does it make sense to have a semi-honest model? Now, for crypto people, this is easy to, right? This talk was originally done for security audience. So why is honest but curious? Because honest but curious is realistic for some situations where the, par the participants are forced to obey the rules of the protocol. Because there is some auditing later, or everything is recorded and observed. So if they misbehave by not following the rules, they, they can be held accountable later. So that's the main reason. Another, another reason, another way, another way to see it, is that a semi-honest participant is the one that is honest doing the protocol, is really honest doing the protocol, but later becomes malicious and tries to extract more information than is allowed, or is supposed to. And then, of course, malicious one is the one that does anything. So arbitrary, arbitrary Byzantine kind of behavior as far as malicious. But then we have to ask the question, who? Who behaves maliciously? Right? Is, is it one party or both parties? And if it's one party, which one? Because we will see that protocols are not always symmetric. Okay? Because if, if we do this kind of a mutual sharing, then they are symmetric, then there's no difference between malicious behavior of either party. But if the protocols are not symmetric, they are one way, then it makes a difference who behaves maliciously. So let's look at a, 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 yet another example, but this one to motivate exactly the protocol, the, the protocols that we're talking about. <coughs> this is called PPIT, Privacy Preserving Information Transfer. It's very simple, primitive. Uh, so we're going to look at this particular example because we have a UCI, and this, this, this weird animal is the uh, mascot. They couldn't come up with a better looking creature, so this is an anteater. And uh, so, so, so imagine that FBI comes to UCI and says, uh, we are um, investigating Gene Sudik. And they would like the file, my personnel file. So what happens? Uh, if UCI picks option one, which is, says, here it is, FBI is should be happy, right? They get what they want. But not really. Let's see. If, if they get the, the, the file from the university, the university knows who is being investigated. Me. Okay, so two things could happen. The university could, uh, the administrators, the bureaucrats, right? They could start spreading rumors about me. Ah, this guy, you know, he's being investigated. Let's, let's make his life difficult. Okay? And why is it bad? Well, it's bad for me. It's also bad for the FBI because if I'm innocent, I can sue them. I live in America. I can sue them. Right? Make a lot of money. It's also bad because maybe the bureaucrats will warn me. Say, hey, run. Go to Venezuela. <laughs> Quickly. Right? Because you're being investigated. So FBI does not want that to happen. So what they want is, of course, my file, and they don't want to reveal the, the, the fact that they're looking for me. Now, the university could just say, forget it, no way. And that's, of course, a losing proposition because FBI will get its way sooner or later. A university could also say, here's everything. Let's open the door to all the personnel files and say, you can look at everything. Just don't take whatever you don't need. Okay, then we have another problem. First, privacy of, maybe they say they're looking for one person, me, but in fact they want to investigate lots of people, lots of people, because they're curious. Right? They just want to investigate lots of people. So that's bad. The other problem is that FBI actually doesn't want this. Because if they get a copy of all of everybody's personnel records, and that copy is lost, they are responsible. The, it's called the liability, right? The liability is on them. And this has happened a lot of times in the U.S. Where some idiot left a laptop on the train with 100,000 or a million social security numbers. Or somebody 
left the laptop near the window and uh, left the room and some burglars came in and stole the laptop. Okay? These kinds of things happen. Or a virus breaks in, you know, into, into the agency and uh, exploits the data. So this is a problem and the FBI doesn't want it either. Okay, so what should happen is just somehow my file or the, the file of the target uh, person should move to FBI but nothing else. So, and it, well, at the same time, you see that guy, he doesn't look very trustworthy. Right? Kind of looks like a criminal if you ask me. So, UCI doesn't want to give it a file just because he asks for, he says, I'm investigating somebody. What they really want to do is Make sure that there's authorization. The FBI should not be able to, like any intelligence agency, right, should not be able to run uncontrolled. Right? It should, if it has a reason to investigate somebody, it should have an authorization. So that's why we call it policy-based. There must be an authorization by some higher authority, a CA or a court. Right? And it must, of course, be privacy-preserving, which is minimize disclosure of sensitive information in the process. And Interestingly enough, the authorization is itself sensitive information. So typically we think of authorization as some kind of a signature. And normally signatures are treated as public information. I give you a signature so you can verify the signature, right? But in this context, it's very strange because actually signatures themselves are sensitive information. So you can never reveal the signature if you want privacy. So the primitive should be like this. So be some kind of a black box. There's a client on one side, and the client has one or more authorizations on one or more IDs. And the server has some kind of a database. It could be just a list of IDs, but more likely it's going to be a database in, in the real world. And somehow, magically, this black box will yield the data, right, the data that corresponds to the IDs for which the client has appropriate authorizations. So that only those items for which the client has authorizations will the client get. Okay? So maybe now you can see why this is kind of similar to set intersection. It's not yet quite set intersection, but it's similar. So there's some related work. Of course, if you ask a theoretical cryptographer, you'll say that all of this can be done trivially with secure computation. All of this. In fact, everything I'm going to talk about today can be done trivially with secure multi-party, just secure two-party computation. But the dirty little secret is, of course, that everybody knows is that it's very inefficient. Right? So if you use Yao's approach, you get, you, you're going to solve the problem, but it's going to be very, very inefficient for most of these primitives. Then there is private information retrieval. So most people, when they see this, ah, this is similar to PII. Well, it's not. And the main reason it's not similar to PII is because PII assumes that the database on the server side is public. Okay? So here, you know, now there is something called keyword PII which is, in fact, similar, but we'll talk about it later. Then there's something called oblivious signature-based envelopes, uh, which is essentially a one-way information transfer. It sort of works like this. Alice has a message to Bob, and, all, and she wants to give it to Bob only if Bob has certain authorization. Okay? So it's a very, very kind of a restricted primitive. It only works for a single, for a single message, right? For a single item data. Then there is uh, PEX, private, uh, public key encryption with keyword search. That's a, there's some literature on this and there's some very cute uh, schemes. In fact, keyword PII and PEX are sort of very similar. But it's not very scalable. So you'll, you know, if you look in the literature, you see that these tend to be way uh, less efficient than what we'll talk about. And then we have private set intersection. Now, private set intersection does not assume that inputs are authorized. Okay? Private set intersection just says, 
Alice has a set, Bob has a set, they compare the set somehow, and they get the intersection. But there's no authorization. But we'll come back to private set intersection later. Um, so let's look at the players here. Now, you might think, of why, why am I talking about this, this uh, topic if the subject really goes towards set intersection? Because this is how our research went. I'm just recreating the course of our research. It, we came to private set intersection this way. Okay, so other people have come to it very different road. So let's look at it anyway, these components. So we have the server and the client. Now the client is the one who wants the information. The server is the one who gets nothing. Just has the information, but he gets nothing. And then there's the court. We must have the court if we have authorization. So the court performs some setup offline in the beginning of time. And then when, when, when the client, FBI agent in this case, wants to investigate me, he presents the court with a some explanation, probably, why I am a bad person, or potentially a bad person, and uh, my social security number or something. And he gets an authorization, basically a signature, and then, of course, the server has all kinds of information like this. Client enters his inputs, server. Now, notice this PPIT is a black box. It's still, we're still treating it as a black box. The server doesn't see the signature, and the client does not see the database. But somehow, in the end, the client only gets my record. OK, some very informal security requirements. So you, won't, you will not see too many Greek letters in this talk. Not because I don't like them. It's difficult to read. So for, of course, like any protocol, uh, something like this must be correct. It must make sense, right? And um, so what about server? Server must have certain properties, like security and privacy. So the client should not be able to access any data unless he's authorized for it. Make sense? Client should not learn any IDs unless it's authorized. Those are two different things. Learning data and learning IDs are two different things. Now, if you are not falling asleep, you might Wonder, in my example with the FBI and, you, and, and, and my university, this is not really the case, this, um, this, this requirement. Because FBI already knows that I work at UCI. Well, because anybody knows who, who works at UCI. It's public information. But in general, this is not the case, right? FBI may or may not know that somebody works or lives someplace. So that's why we have this, this requirement. And then client privacy is that server cannot learn any authorizations. So if the client has any authorizations, the server should not learn what they are. Okay? In fact, it should not even learn if there are any. Because maybe the, maybe the client is just playing games, but the server should not know whether even any valid authorization. He might estimate an upper bound on, on the number of those authorizations. And then there are kind of more optional properties that are quite important that, if you, that, that come in only if you run the protocol multiple times, right? In any real, realistic setting, you're going to run the protocol more than once. So then there's client unlikability, which is server should not be able to tell if the client is running on the same inputs. Okay? But if you, right? So if the client, FBI, comes in twice and says, we're looking for somebody. Can you give us the data? The, 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 the server, in this case UCI, should not be able to tell that this is the same data they're looking for, or the same person. And then on the other side, another side is, uh, sorry, is uh, client should not be able to tell if the server's database is the same. Now, this is a little tricky requirement, because if the client runs the, the protocol, twice, and let's say obtains the same data, well, he can see that, you know, my record, for example, if the client obtains Gene Sudik's record, he sees that that record did not change. So he, he gets that information. But what should not be able to tell is if anything else changed in the database. Okay? So for example, university may have hired 100 more people, or fired 20 people. The FBI should not be able to see that fluctuations, the changes. 
And then finally, the typical requirement of forward security. That somehow if you, uh, the client's current authorization, if a client has an authorization today, right, but he has run the protocol before, the today's authorization should not in any way violate the privacy or security of previous protocol interactions. Okay. This is the forward security in the context of this. Um, so we're going to look at one very, very simple example. Because I don't really work with pairings or, or uh, elliptic curve cryptography very much, because I'm afraid of math. Yeah. I'm afraid of elliptic curves either. Uh, there's probably some disease with a Greek name that says what it, you know, elliptic curvophobia. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to work in a, in a more standard or uh, boring setting. All right, so at least for the beginning, uh, okay, so this is just your standard RSA, except that we're going to take advantage of uh, a couple of full domain cryptographic hash function. Okay. All right, otherwise, we're going to have a standard RSA. Who is going to use RSA? Well, the RSA is going to be set up by the court. Right, because remember, we need authorizations. Okay, so, okay, so how is it working? What? Sorry. So, the server, let's, we are, we are idealize this and say, okay, let's, the server has only one element, like one employee or one element or something. We're going to quickly see how this works with, with more than one. And the client has one search element, IDC, right? That's like my name. And so, there is this RSA setup. The client presents the ID to the court. The gets a third, yeah, you know, that's the one Greek letter you're going to see. Gets a signature. And then um, at some later time, is going to approach the server. Now remember, signatures are sensitive information. You cannot reveal them. So what are we going to do? We're going to encrypt the signature. Right? So bind it. So that's what this does. That's the, that's the intuition. Now, because we have to work in, you know, QRN, we're going to square everything, so don't need to really worry about that. That's details. But what we're going to do is, for every interaction, you see, we're going to blind the signature. So notice right away, just looking at this message, new, oh, second Greek letter, sorry. Uh, what, what, what is G? G, uh, it's a generator, QRN. Yeah, sorry, forgot to say, generator in the QRN. So, we go G to the R, it's going to blind the signature, okay, and that's going to be sent to the server. Now, notice right away that if you run this multiple times, you, can, you cannot tell that this is the same signature, right? So, this, it's unlinkable to, as far as the server is concerned. You cannot tell what, what kind of signature there is there, right? Potentially that. So, what's happening on this side? Well, actually, what's happening on the, on the side, on the server side, is kind of a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, right? It's just a standard, almost a very, very boring Diffie-Hellman. Okay, so the, what the server is going to do is, 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 is basically this step right here is a, what's called implicit signature verification. He's going to pretend that if, if that new indeed hides the signature, then by raising it to the E, he exposes the, right, he would get whatever, whatever point text was signed. In other words, H of IDC. If it was indeed a signature. If it's not a signature, then he's going to get something, some garbage. And if in fact IDC is hiding here, then multiplying by H of IDS will cancel it out if and only if IDC and IDS are the same. Okay? That's just simple math. Otherwise, if IDS and IDC are not the same, what's going to wind up being here is something unpredictable. And this KS is what is the key computed by the server on this side that will only match a corresponding key, KC, on the client side if IDS and IDC are the same and sigma is a signature. On, I, on, on, on that ID. That's the claim. And so this is, this is just the encryption of the data. So this is not very interesting. This is just the computation of another data encryption key and encryption of the data. This is the important part. So client 
percent will then decrypt the data if and only if. Now, if you look, this is the correctness um, claim that, uh, in fact, things cancel out only if IDC and IDS are the same. All right, you can do the same thing with Schnorr. Well, almost the same thing. Almost. Well, every time you do something with RSA, then there's a natural question, can we do this in some kind of an El Gamal derivative setting? And it turns out we can do this with Schnorr. And there's an attraction to Schnorr, right? Because Schnorr is actually cheaper, or should be cheaper. Well, as I know, it's possible, but it has, uh, has some issues. So this is just uh, to remind you, well, that's what Schnorr works li uh, looks like. So what we're going to see is that Schnorr is actually similar to RSA. It's going to be also a two-message interaction. But Schnorr signatures, and these are fundamental uh, limitations, you cannot blind them somehow. You know, not in this context. You cannot, you cannot, I mean, if somebody knows how to do it, I, I would love to hear it. So, and you'll see that client introduces no randomness. So there's not going to be this kind of blinding like we saw with um, RSA. And what's going to happen is, well, exactly this. Still have the same inputs. Still have the same court, except now it sets up with Schnorr. And now he's going to sign and give us a two-part Schnorr signature. And here's the intuition. The way that we're going to give something to the server is we're going to give server half a signature. See, I would say the RSA signature is just one number, right? Just one number. It's a one tuple. Schnorr signature is a tuple. We can split it in half. And turns out, if you give somebody half a Schnorr signature, right, they can recreate what the other half could be in the exponent. Assuming that they know the message that's being signed. Right? That's, that's it. So that's, that's right away gives you the idea of what is being done here. It's a nice property of Schnorr signatures, right? It's a good, it's a good property to explore. Right? So what, it, you know, signatures X and S, so we're going to send one half, right? Now notice that you can do the following with the, with the Schnorr signature. You, can, you know, if you have it, you can take X, or the first part, multiplied by the public key of the authority, you know, to raise the power H I D C, right, the message is being signed, you're going to get G to the S, which is the second part, right? So what's going to happen on this side is the server is going to try to recreate what G to the S should be. So this is the part where the server recreates what? Because the server does not know if the client has a signature. The client could be giving it garbage. Okay? But what the client is giving is a kind of alleged, alleged or purported half a signature. And so what the server is going to do is going to say, okay, if this is a signature, if this X is indeed half of a real signature, right, and if my ID is the same thing as his ID, then this value here should be the same as G to the S. But S exists only if there was a signature. Otherwise, it doesn't simply, it simply does not exist. Okay, so now, this G to the S can be used as a half of a Diffie-Hellman computation. Okay? So, this is the, the actual Diffie-Hellman half key for the, for the uh, client. And this C here is the encryption of the data corresponding to the IDS under this key this key itself is derived from this key, which is computed based on the knowledge of G to the S. But for the client to recompute the same key, the client must know S. Without the knowledge of S, which is not revealed, the client cannot recompute the key. And the claim is, and this is proven, that this works if and only if IDS and IDC are the same, and the client has a valid Schnorr signature on ID, on that ID. And it's easier here to even see correctness. Oops. So here's an interesting observation, right? 
This is actually a simple protocol. Very simple. Uh, the problem is that that x is always the same. So if you run the protocol multiple times, it's linkable. The server does not know what you're looking for, but you know you're looking for the same thing. And because of that, there is no forward security, right? And there's no client unlinkability. It was an RSA, you get both. Now you can do, I, I don't have, actually I have the slides, but I didn't want to uh, get into it. You can also do something like this with IDE. Okay, now just to tell you, it's trivial, right? How would you do it with IDE? Well, with IDE assumes a lot of luxury. The luxury with IDE is that there's this mythical creature called public key generator. And you go to the public key generator and you get a key corresponding to some ID, right? The secret key that corresponds to some public ID. And so in the IDE world, you can imagine a very simple solution to this problem where the client doesn't really send anything to the server. The server simply encrypts data under the ID of the data. So it takes my file, GeneCidix file, and it encrypts it under my identity derived key and sends it to the client. And the client can only decrypt it if he has an authorization. And what is an authorization? It's not a signature. It's just a secret key corresponding to my identity. That's trivial. So you say, why aren't you doing this? Well, let's see. Why am I not doing this? First of all, ID is more expensive. Ah, but there's less interaction. Right? Because I said the client doesn't need to send anything. But how did the server know that the client wants something? So it's a chicken and egg problem. The client has to ask for something in order to get something back. Okay? And second, ID does not give us, does not give us even unlinkability of forward security in this simple model. So if you want to build in unlinkability of forward security, ID becomes more expensive. Okay, than this. And what about if you have multiple records? In the real world, the, the server has multiple records. He has a database, not just one I ID and one record. Well, ah, it's, not, it's not a big deal. It, the extension is trivial. Uh, instead of uh, sending one ciphertext, the, the server composes uh, W ciphertext. If it has W records, it will compose W ciphertext, and then the client will have to try to decrypt all of them. Right, so if we go back here, ah oh well, something like this. The C is a ciphertext, so if, the, if there are many, many IDs or many data records like this, there would have to be many ciphertexts. And the client would have to try to decrypt all of them, which would be inefficient. But, well, it's easy to fix the problem. You just reuse the same randomness on all ciphertexts which is not dangerous, sounds dangerous, but it's not, because we, we're, only, we're only using, we're only computing different, we'll compute different Diffie-Hellman keys, because uh, notice here, the key, this kind of key, is computed differently for every record. So if you had a different ID here, this would be, it would be fine to reuse this, the same R. And uh, to solve the problem with trying to decrypt all ciphertext, we actually add a tag or a label to each ciphertext. The tag is based on the key. Like one-way function, collision resistance, one-way function of the key. So the client can now search. If when he recomputes the key, he can also ha you know, hash them and look for those tags and essentially not waste any time trying to decrypt things that he cannot or won't be able to. What about multiple records? So now it's becoming a little more interesting. What if we have the client that has multiple authorizations. So now the university is full of criminals and, you see, and the FBI comes with a long list of suspects all authorized. Okay, so what happens then? So now, uh, actually sorry, this is, I jumped ahead. This is still, this is still that same one record on the, on the client side and multiple records. Yeah. So th this, is, this is what I was talking about before. Sorry, I jumped a little bit ahead. 
So this is what happens when you have multiple records here and only one record there. There's the same R, you see the same R is being reused as a Diffie-Hellman cap key. The ciphertexts are encryption under each record's key. And then the tags, the T1 from TW, are the tags that help uh, the client identify the appropriate ciphertext. So the ordering of the tags and the ordering of the ciphertext is the same. Right, so then the idea is that the, the client only gets those for which it has the, the, the tags. Okay, now multiple authorizations. That's what I really was going towards. So the, 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 the client now has multiple authorizations. Okay, and the problem becomes that if the client has multiple authorizations, if you use this protocol, it's very easy to see you're going to get a quadratic cost. Okay? Because if the client has V authorizations and he, and he sends them in a, blinded, in a blinded fashion over to the server, then, right, like this, then there would have to be this, this many keys, like of this form computer. Right, so for every element that the server receives and for every element that he has, he would have to compute this ugly value. Well, it's not an ugly value, it's just to compute many of them. And, that, and that's basically square, or V times W, which is the, the product of, of the number of elements on each side. Okay, so that's not very nice. Uh, and it, it, the, the, the only interesting thing is, of course, we can actually optimize this and uh, make it a little more palatable by noticing that the keys are computed like that, and this requires V exponentiations, on, uh, and this requires W exponentiations, and some of this stuff can be pre-computed. So, oops. So, in fact, we can reduce the cost to, rather than V times W exponentiations, to V times W multiplications. But it's still not pretty. So now let's talk about. So this is a very this is a, primi a primitive primitive. Let's go towards a little more something a little more uh, interesting, which is private set intersection. And we are going to start with actually authorized private set intersection because that's how we came to this problem. We are coming from the this authorized private preserving information transfer, which has only like one, basically one record on the client side and, and many records on the server side, to a more general setting. So and we're going to call it practical, and of course, in my opinion, practical is number one abused, misused word in crypto. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, so we're going to look back at this example. So remember the DEA and the state police? In this kind of, in the first example, DEA is looking for agents with criminal records. In this guy, in, in, in that example, Authorization is probably not necessary, and it's a one-way, right? We call the second example of CIA and MI6 looking for common terror suspects. In that example, mutual information transfer is sought, and uh, authorizations are probably necessary, maybe on both sides. In the two real estate agencies comparing customer lists, again, we probably don't want to have frivolous inputs, so there's authorization. With IRS and Swiss Bank, Less clear, less clear. So there are all kinds of flavors where authorizations are either not necessary at all, or they are necessary on one side, or they are necessary on both. And you might say, well, wait a minute. If you have a one-way one -way kind of set intersection setting, why would you want to have authorizations on the server side? Right? It's, well, it's cool, why, why on the client side? So the client doesn't come to the server and say, I just want everything, all right? I input some arbitrary set. Why on the server side? It's on the server side, perhaps, because in some situations, the server has a fixed database, and entries in that database must be authorized. And so when he actually participates in this information transfer, he must prove to the client that it did it in good faith, that it was actually all the, inf all the records that it sent were actually real records. They weren't some frivolous information. On the way, the same record recruited many times. Okay? So uh, this, is, this is a subtle issue. And in fact, I'm not going to show you how to solve it. Because it's something we're still working on. But uh, there, is, there is motivation to have authorized inputs on, on, on the server side as well. So we're going 
going to start also thinking of what, what if the parties aren't overtly malicious? That is, that is, what if we are dealing with with uh, kind of a either forced or just benign sort of honest but curious model? Do we really need authorization? So if we don't need authorizations, maybe things will can become cheaper. So just a bird's eye view. So in a in mutual private set intersection, not authorized, just mutual private set intersection, we have two players, no longer client and server because they're, they're really peers. Uh, each with its with a set of values, and of course there is a slightly interesting sub question. Well, what happens if it's really not a set but a multi-set? And of course, why would it be a multi-set? Well, because a database is a multi-set, right? If you have uh, you have the same keys appearing more than once, even the same name John Smith can appear in the database more than once. So uh, you, you, it could it could very much, very well apply to multi-set. Uh, setting, but uh, here, so the, the both players would would uh, obtain the intersection of the respective sets, and well, of course, they are the same intersection. The one-way case is simpler. Here, only the client gets the intersection. Server learns nothing. Nothing. Not exactly the case. Not exactly true. Nothing. Um, the client. Sorry, the server does learn something. You'll see in 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 all of the uh, protocols that. Well, out there in the literature, this, the, 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 the server learns something, and that is something is the size of the client set, or at least the upper bound. And that seems to be unavoidable. Emphasis on scenes. All right, so or you can add data transfer. And so this is a trivial kind of little add-on uh, that you know, if the server really has a database rather than a set, then client is not really interested in just the intersection. He is interested in the intersection together with whatever data accompanies the set elements on the server side. And in the authorized version, well, it's more bells and whistles. It adds the fact that the client only gets the data if, and, and only learns the identity, even identities of those records, if it has the a valid authorization for that record. We call it AppC. Oh, authorized private set instruction. So then we have to, well, leads us to the following questions, but maybe it should lead us to a break. Yeah. Uh, or not. I, I, I can go on, but. Uh, <laughs> uh,